Welcome back to the Google Ads Lead Gen Show. My name is Michelle Kopp from Level 28 Media. Hey guys, my name is Dean Hua from Sachi Studio. And today we are doing a deep dive into generating leads from Google Ads for medical practices. So this is actually Dean's uh, area of specialty. I have worked with medical practices as well, but he has a lot of medical clients. So there's going to be a lot of great value that we're going to be dropping in this episode. So please stay tuned until the very end. Um, so Dean, you want to go ahead and take it away with the first topic that we wanted to discuss? Yeah. So just looking at our notes, I think the first thing we want to do is what should doctors, healthcare pr practitioners, or wellness practitioners, what should you guys know about this area um, before you start doing Google advertising? And the first thing that comes to mind is that certain health terms are restricted or completely blocked. Uh, just depends on the niche. Like for example, you can't advertise cannabis on Google ads. Well, in a way you can, but it takes a lot of work to kind of circumvent the systems, but basically you can't. So if you're in a cannabis niche, don't bother because you can't say stuff like cannabis or weed or uh, some of the other terms that they use. Whereas other niches, for example, chiropractor, physical therapy, pain management, acupuncture. Um, there are certain words you have to be careful of. Um, they will restrict the search volume for certain keywords. They won't necessarily block you. For example, uh, something as simple as just saying leg pain, uh, they can lower the search volume uh, for your ads, meaning you won't get as much click traffic. Now, again, this isn't universal. I've competed in certain niches such as acupuncture where I can say leg pain and I don't get uh, any sort of penalty whatsoever. Whereas with certain chiropractors, if I say leg pain, uh, search volume goes down. Uh, I know within pain management, there are certain terms you can't use, especially uh, medicine that's sort of like on the cutting edge right now that hasn't been approved. So you have to be careful of what you say or don't say. Um, anything you want to add to that before I move on? No, I just wanted, I had a follow up question. Is this in regards to keywords that you're bidding on, or is this in regards to ad copy and what's also on your, your landing page? So I, I would say generally this is more to do with keywords that you're bidding on and the ad copy. I haven't noticed too much of an issue with seeing these same keywords on the landing page. That said, I do try if if I know I'm I'm entering a niche where it's kind of iffy, I tend to be very conservative and I don't say those keywords on the landing page and I try to find different ways uh, of saying it. Yeah, other different ways of saying it, synonyms or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's exactly what I've experienced as well. Um, so yeah, Google will limit you, but then the thing is you don't really know how often you're going to appear for it. So you're, you're kind of taking a, a chance when you're, you know, in this industry. Um, but you know, if this is your industry, this is your industry and you're going to have to figure out a way to make it work. So yeah, there are restrictions, but it is possible to make it work with the limitations. Yeah. Um, so moving on, I would say there are some niches where it's just too crowded. Um, the first one that comes to mind, because I've had experience with this, is chiropractors. Um, especially if you compete in not necessarily just major markets, but even suburban mid-sized markets, it can get pretty crowded just because there's a chiro every two or three blocks or whatnot. Um, so because there's so much fierce competition within these, some, some of these niches, such as chiro and physical therapy, um, the consumer treats your service as a commodity, meaning they think that one Cairo is the same thing as another Cairo. Whereas if you're a chiropractor, you think you're so, you're so much different than your competition. And I respect that viewpoint, but it's just that with consumers, they don't necessarily see it that way. And I'll give an example of a campaign where I just completely failed. For example, I had a client who was a chiropractor in San Francisco major market. He gets tons of great reviews, really good guy, good phone uh, reception where they pick up. Um, he had a very he healthy ad spend, good reputation within the local community. He was uh, a chiropractor of choice for his university. Um, after two months and spending roughly about $4,000, we couldn't make that money back. It was just way too competitive because of a couple of things. Number one, uh, San Francisco, there's, like I said, there's a chiropractor on every other corner. 
And number two, when people do a search for a chiropractor in San Francisco, they're not really looking for a chiropractor in San Francisco per se, because that's a, a metropolitan market. They're looking for a chiropractor within certain neighborhoods, right? So because it's so tough to, to cover every single neighborhood, that was really tough. And just because um, number three, people are, if they're talking to you, they're probably talking to a couple other chiros as well. So because of that, we didn't do very well. Um, but there are other niches. For example, I have a couple of acupuncture practices. We do really well. Um, and they're competing in small markets. So I would say certain niches are pretty crowded. PT and Cairo comes to mind. I can't necessarily cover every single one of them because I haven't competed in every single one of them. Um, but that, those are two markets that, or two niches that come to mind. I had a follow up question for you. So if it's that competitive and you're saying that, you know, a lot of these uh, medical like providers um, are commoditized, do you think offers are something that could be valuable? Have you tested offers? Um, I've personally seen for, you know, chiropractors um, like big ones, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, well, your first, you know, adjustments, $30 just to get people in the door um, just to, as a bait, but have you tried any offers and do you see this work in the medical field? I haven't extensively tested them where we do a, a true AB split test. Um, my gut feeling is that I don't think they move the needle much, especially within the Cairo niche, because at least as far as I'm concerned, I think a lot of consumers know that the initial offer is just that they, they don't expect to be paying that low of a price every single time. It's like, dentistry if you will right a lot of people a lot of dentists will, they'll do very cheap teeth cleaning because uh, right. they know they can upsell and i think consumers know that um so my gut reaction my gut instinct is i don't think it moves and you know i think it may help a little bit whether or not it helps enough to be wildly profitable i personally i don't think it is yeah and plus but even w with that said, I think there's certain doctors that just don't want to compete on price and i think that's a very valid concern as well Right, right. Yeah. So they're not as concerned about volume per se, because if you're more concerned about volume, then you're going to be offering these types of discounts just to get anyone in the door. I, um, I would say, and just to interrupt, I would say if you want to do an offer and you have, you feel like you have a really good offer, I think Facebook ads is a much better platform. And yes, Facebook ads still work within the health niche. For example, I've seen, I actually had a Cairo client. Um, he was just blowing it up on Facebook ads for his market. I, he was in a mid-market size, I think it was Columbus, Ohio. So it was a mid-market and he was just blowing up. He had an offer? really good ROI. He had a good offer. Um, it wasn't that, it well, wasn't like a spectacular offer either. Uh, if I recall, I think the offer was just basically come in for initial evaluation. This is what we're charging. I think the initial price was under hundred bucks. And I think it was just a creative that was better than anything else. He had a really good reputation within the community, good reviews. Um, I think he appears very well on camera as well. So all of that <laughs> help. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So uh, the next topic that we wanted to cover was keyword selection and bidding strategy. So let's talk about um, negative keyword selection. What is your approach when it comes to, or, and also positive keyword selection or just regular keyword selection. You want to go through your process for how you go about um, putting together that strategy. Yeah. So I think this strategy isn't any different than some of the other niches I compete in. For example, um, I think the biggest ad spend waste or the biz biggest contributor to ad spend waste within the health niche is your local competition. So what I used to do years ago when I was younger in the paid search field is we would manually look up all of the local brands on Google or Yelp and then add them to a negative keyword library. But over time, that just got too, in, uh, too manually intensive. So what we've done is we now have our own scraping software where, where we will just simply scrape the local web for all of the popular uh, doctors in the area add them to a negative keyword list and then upload that before we start the campaign. So that can save potentially up to 50% of your monthly ad spend. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you didn't have uh, a negative keyword library for local brands and you were spending $2,000 $2, a month, um, half of that could be going to ad waste. So by uploading a library, um, you could save potentially up to up to $1,000. 
Um, other things that we add to the library for negative keywords is, um, I would say top of the funnel keywords, for example, back pain. I've seen a lot of doctors just bid on that keyword back pain. But what happens is that there's a lot of people who's just doing a research and they're not ready to buy within the next couple of days. They, they may not be ready until weeks or months down the road. So anything related to, you know, pain, like back pain, leg pain, ear pain, uh, we block that out. Now, if they sat there and they're bidding on chiropractor back pain, I, I, I would bid on that. That's a positive keyword. But just back pain alone, um, usually I block that. Yeah, yeah. Um, positive keywords, it just depends on the niche. Like physical therapy and Cairo, there's only a dozen or so keywords that move the needle. Acupuncture is sort of the same thing. We just generally, we bid on the professions uh, or job title. And um, it's pretty Yeah, simple. it's very straightforward from, pretty straightforward, from that. Yeah. Yeah, from that point of view. And then for match type, um, it's not, this is actually not just happening in the medical field. It's just across the board. Phrase match, uh, public service announcement is very dangerous these days. Um, and uh, for the reason of bringing in local competitors. So just be mindful that if you're going after phrase match terms, even some broad match terms, you need to have that negative keyword list in place. So you know, you have your own scraping software. There's a tool that I've used called D7 Lead Finder that you can enter the metropolitan area that you're trying to find local con uh, local contacts for with the specific industry that you're in. And then it will go and scrape the internet and try to grab as many of the people in that area or businesses so you can add those as negative keywords. Um, but yeah, I mostly... I mostly use exact match, sometimes phrase match, but you still need to have a very strong negative keyword list. Any any more thoughts on that? No, I, I think uh, that's actually a pretty good suggestion. I never thought of D7. I'm, I'm very well aware of it, but I just never considered using D7 lead finder uh, for this particular um, part of the workflow. Yeah, yeah. No, it's worked really, really well for me. Um, and then... Let's talk about uh, bidding strategies. What type of bid strategies do you see working well? Um, I can imagine that you know, in, it, it's all going to depend on your budget and it's all, also going to depend on how many leads you're getting per month. Um, so if you are in a very localized area, uh, very tight radius, you're probably not going to be getting as many conversions um, as you'd like in order to switch to an automated bid strategy. So you want to talk about your approach with that? Yeah, so this is a pretty simple uh, process for me as well. Generally speaking, any client that's only spending $1,000 a month, I put them on manual bidding where we will micromanage the process, especially within the first couple months. I think the first couple months is where we put in the most work to make sure we weed out um, any trash keywords and things that just aren't generating conversions. Um, after a couple months, uh, assuming they have the budget, which I'll get to in a second, after a couple months, we will consider an automated bidding strategy. I think an automated bidding strategy such as max conversions can work um, in niches where the keywords are very homogenous. Again, just going back to like acupuncture, you know, how many different ways can you really do a search for acupuncture? Not many. Acupuncture near me, acupuncture, acupuncturist, acupuncture in XYZ city. So if the niche is very homogenous, I certainly consider a max conversions uh, bidding strategy if we can generate enough conversions within the first 30 or 60 days. Uh, that said, the ideal client that's suited for max conversions or any sort of automated bidding strategy, I would say you need to be spending at least $2,000 a month. Um, I have an acupuncture client where uh, she has a pretty healthy ad spend budget of 2K, and we do very well with max conversions. There are some months where uh, it doesn't do as well. I wouldn't say it performs poorly, it just doesn't do as well. But lately, uh, as of this recording, it's August. Um, we've been doing really well. I think we're getting roughly uh, fifty dollars for a conversion, and the conversion being measured as a phone call. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, I actually wanted to jump to a topic that I think could be super beneficial for anyone, you know, in the medical uh, field that's trying to run Google Ads. Um, I want to 
really dive into insurance um, mm. because that's a huge decider when it comes to people deciding on which medical provider that they want to move forward with. Um, and I wanted to just get your thoughts on, um, you know, your approach with how you incorporate insurance into your campaigns and how you're able to uh, attract people with certain insurances and, and get people to engage when they have a specific type of insurance. Because that's really a that's really the number one deciding factor besides great reviews and stuff like that. Yeah. But even if you have great reviews, but you don't accept my insurance, I'm not going to work with you because I'm already paying for insurance from my work or out of pocket. So I want to make sure that I'm going to someone within network, not someone out of network and paying hundreds of dollars. Um, so let's go ahead and deep dive into this topic. Yeah. So, I mean, this could easily be a 30 minute conversation to itself because people when I say people, I, I mean, marketing agencies who work with doctors, as well as the doctors themselves, they don't understand how much of a factor insurance plays into converting uh, web traffic. So generally speaking, at a very high level, if you accept insurance, you're going to get more conversions, you're going to get more phone calls. Just, it's that simple. If you don't accept insurance, or you don't work with as, as many insurance providers, um, you're just not going to get as many uh, bookings. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You you know, there's a lot of doctors who don't want to work with various insurance providers or people who just are looking for Medicare or Medicaid um, because it just eats into their profit. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, people or doctors who work with insurance, yes, you're going to get more phone calls and you'll get more conversions, but your profitability probably isn't as much versus a cash-based practice. So the next question is, well, uh, Dean, you know, if I'm just a cash-based practice, should I advertise on Google? Will it work? Absolutely, it still works. Again, going back to one of my, actually, I have two acupuncture clients. They both uh, work with cash-based, although one is purely cash-based and one is a hybrid approach where she does insurance and cash-based. Um, both do very well. Um, and I think part of it's just uh, acupuncture isn't as competitive as, say, physical therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I have a physical therapy client who works in a very small market, and he works with a lot of different insurance providers. And even after insurance, he still makes good money uh, off of Google ads. So that works for him. Uh, conversely, I have a guy who is a Cairo in a very, very small market. I think population is 50,000. And we're getting a crap ton of conversions every single month. He's, in fact, if you measure just by conversions alone, he's one of my best clients. Like and he's cash based. No, he's insurance based. Combo. Oh, insurance. insurance okay. Based. Um, I think he could be cash based as well. Um, but he definitely works with a lot of different insur insurance, including Medicare or Medicaid. I forget which one it was. Um, but once I found out what his profit margins with insurance, it was very small. It was only a few hundred dollars a month per client. Like when I asked him what the lifetime value is of a client, he said it was like less than five hundred dollars. Wow! I was like, Ooh, wow, that's really small. Because I'm work, I'm used to working with doctors whose lifetime value is anywhere from two k to five k. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, just going back to this this Cairo client of mine, we get lots and lots of phone calls each and every single month. But because the lifetime value is so small he's not as profitable as some of my other clients are. So it's sort of a balance. I, I won't sit there and say you'll, you'll blow it up just because you, you accept insurance. But at the same time, I won't say um, you shouldn't advertise on Google if you're just purely cash-based. It really just depends on the market, how good of a practice you have, and how good you are. Reputation, at yeah. You know, patience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a, I had a physical therapy client, um, and they have probably 10 locations in the San Francisco Bay area. Um, so super competitive, uh, but they've got a lot of different, you know, uh, a bunch of different locations. The challenge was it's all cash based. <laughs> mm. So they would get a lot of people calling, um, from the ads, but then everyone that's calling has insurance and then they're like, trying to explain why they do things cash-based, but then the people that are calling don't care. They're like, well, I have insurance. I'm going to go to someone that's within my network that is going to be taking my insurance. I'm not going to be paying $200 for a physical therapy session. 
So that was the challenge with that specific um, account because see, I can run the ads and get you the phone calls, but if that's, you know, if that's something that is the, you know, fundamental core of your business where you can't accept the insurance, then you're not going to be getting the patients that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, by the way, do you still have that client or? No, we're on pause right now. They're okay. planning to restart things pretty soon. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say was that's actually when I'm working with doctors, that's actually one of the first questions I ask is, A, do you take insurance? And B, what's your LTV lifetime value? And that, that'll help me kind of do some basic math in my head as to whether or not this could be a good client once I factor in everything else as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then what was another thing? Another approach, um, this is not really necessarily something to do with medical practitioners, but I've worked with home health, so it's kind of related. Um, an approach that you can use with keywords, um, and I've also worked with uh, rehab centers too, and this is very interesting, is you can bid on insurance terms. So let's say if you accept... Aetna, um, United Healthcare, uh, Medi Medicare, Medicaid, if those are insurances that you can accept, those are keywords that you can bid on. So um, it could be like hospice care that accepts Medicare or yeah. Molina Healthcare hospice, you know, agency or Delta Dental um, uh, orthodontist or something like that, because you already know this person has the insurance that you have to offer um, or that you take. So that's an easier way to get in the door. Um, I feel like a lot of people, when they search, though, they'll probably go to their insurance provider's website and just go uh, you know, down the list or yeah. they'll search based off of if they're looking for an OBGYN or an orthodontist that's with a network. And then they'll go like cross check reviews and stuff. But it's still powerful. It still works. Have you used this approach when it comes to keyword strategy? No, I haven't. Um, I'm very well aware of it. I, I see those sort of search terms pop up in the uh, SQR report all the time. Uh, the reason why I don't really use it is just the clients I work with, they're generally cash-based or okay. Okay. Um, they're just a little bit higher and they're looking for clients that's not necessarily looking for those keywords. Yeah. And the problem too, if you're working with someone that's all cash-based or they don't want like Medicaid types of clients or, or patients is when someone's looking for something like home health care, you have no idea what their insurance is. You have no idea if they can afford your services. So if they are paying out of pocket and it is, you know, all cash based, that's where the challenge is. And, you know, I've tried approaches where it's like, okay, let's focus on more affluent cities or higher income demographics. But sometimes just because there's a higher income demographic, doesn't mean that they're going to be willing to pay cash out of pocket just because, yeah. you know, there's people that are more affluent doesn't mean that they're going to want to um, be spending premium out of pocket for your services. So that's also something that I've learned over the years. Yeah, uh, it's funny you say that. I totally agree. In fact, when you look at the demographics report where it shows uh, income brackets, like top 10%, yeah. top 20, top 30, I actually think the ones that convert the best are usually the middle class. Like yeah. we're, th we're looking at probably top 30 percentile to top 50 percentile. Um, mm -hmm. bottom, bottom 50 can be hit or miss. Right. Um, and I tell, I have client, I actually have an ortho client where he's, uh, she said, the, the front desk said, Dean, we're getting, we're getting a lot more calls, Dean, but the problem is a lot of these calls are asking about Medicare or Medicaid. So I said, okay, well, you know, what I can do is go into um, the audience report and then block out uh, age 65 plus. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyone yeah. who's age 65 plus, I they blocked them out because they're looking yeah. for Medicare. So mm -hmm. that helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. But household income is tricky because yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a hit or miss. So I, I try to be very careful when it comes to like blocking out specific, you know, household demographics, especially if they are cash based, because we can't assume that just because someone lives in a more affluent community, that they're going to be more, uh, more uh, liberal with their purse strings to, <laughs> to pay out of pocket. Yeah. And what people don't understand about Google's, um, um, the way Google segments household income is that, uh, from my understanding, I think they look at the zip code. 
So for yeah. example, if a cer cer certain zip codes will have a mix of both affluent and middle class. So if you only want to bid on affluent or, or let, let's say you want to block out the middle class, you may end up blocking out the affluent as well because of how Google segments the zip code. All right. So for example, if you feel like the top 30 percentile isn't generating um, conversions for you, you decide to block that out, but you may accidentally block out some of the more affluent people as well. Yeah. So something to be care careful of. Yeah. Quick anecdote. Um, so I worked with a home health agency who was only taking cash-based patients. They charge like 200 bucks an hour for to have like a private nurse come to your house. And they were going after really high net worth individuals in New York and New Jersey. Um, so I tried an approach where it was like, okay, well, let's try to go after, um, and this was all learning. Of course, I didn't know. I was just like, okay, let's just test this out. Let's go after higher income demographics. Let's go after neighborhoods where, um, you know, their income is, you know, this high blah, blah, blah. But then the challenge is when you're trying to go after people in this niche, they're older. So it's not necessarily has to do with household income because a lot of them don't really have income coming in or their income is really low, but they have a high net worth. So it's really hard to root balance it out. So that was, that was the big challenge that we experienced. And every phone call coming in was like Medicare, Medicaid, and they didn't accept that. Um, so, you know, people that were looking for home health, um, you know, they were hoping to get, or on Google were calling, hoping to get some uh, provider that would accept Medicare, Medicaid, but they said, no, we, we, we only do cash base and it's like $200 an hour to have a private mm. nurse. So that was, that was a huge challenge. And actually, you know, what I told this client was Google ads is just not a good fit for you based off of, you know, all of these restrictions that we have. If you have accept, if you accept more, um, then we, we would be able to get more, uh, you know, coming through, but you know, with all these restrictions, it makes it extremely hard. Then on top of that, you know, if you're going after really high net worth individuals, the likelihood of them searching on Go a bunch of them searching on Google, finding you and converting is not going to be that high. I think a lot of these really high net worth individuals are going to be looking through like word of mouth referrals or, you know, something like that. So I don't I know agree. if you had any experience on that, but that was, you know, just a personal anecdote that I wanted to share when it comes to, you know, working with, you know, a company in the healthcare field that didn't accept any insurance. So that made it extremely hard to get, you know, results um, for, you know, the elderly um, industry. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, the only thing I'll add is that sometimes, you know, I, I would love, for me, I think as marketers, we're good at marketing, but we're not necessarily always experts in the, in the industry you're in. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it's just a dice roll. And it is. Kind of it can it be. Out. And if it doesn't work, you know, you move on, you try something else. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Don't take things personally. <laughs> just, you know, keep going because at the end of the day, we learned. And then I just told them it's not a good fit. So for, for Google at this point in time. Yep. So um, um, let's move on. Any pro tips you want to offer within this industry? Yeah, let's talk about landing pages then. Um, I think one of the big things, um, well, I know you're going to probably want to talk about video. Um, so I'll, I'll let you, I'll save that for you. But going back to the insurance, if you do accept insurance, make sure that you have the insurance on your, on your landing page, all the different insurances that you accept. You can also say on the, um, on the landing page, some, something along the lines of like free benefits check, you know, if that's something that you do provide, um, so that your receptionist or whoever's taking the call can double check to make sure that, that, com uh, that the insurance is accepted. Um, friendly pictures of the practitioner, uh, pictures of the office, make sure it looks clean, have reviews. Um, how about you when it comes to video, what else would you add? Yeah, so I think you, yeah, I'm I'm a big I've always said when it comes to healthcare, it's a very personal decision that every every patient is trying to make. And it's a very subjective thing as well, because you could be a male doctor in his forties and you have all the credentials in the world, you're probably better than ninety percent of your competition. But the patient or prospective patient may not hire you because you're a male in his 40s and she may be looking for another doctor in her 30s, right? That she can relate to. 
Um, but I, I tell that anecdote just because I think you need to do as good of a job as you can to humanize your landing page. And when I say humanize, don't just sit there and put like stock photos on the landing page or direct them to a service page that has a gazillion words that no one's going to read through. Um, but going to video, I am a firm believer that social media videos has a growing influence on landing pages. And what I've slowly started to do with some of my doctor clients who are social media savvy is that we'll take just a couple of their TikTok or Instagram or YouTube videos and we'll embed it on the landing page just so the prospective patient can kind of get an idea of their personality and how they portray themselves and what sort of, uh, I guess, bedside manners they may have or don't have. Um, I think that has an impact. How much of an impact? It's really hard for me to measure because I don't do a lot of significant A-B split testing here. But I do think if you if you adhere to my belief that you should humanize your service as best as possible online, then I do think you should consider embedding your videos onto your landing page. That way you can present your best self. Um, is everyone going to watch the videos? No. For every 100 clicks you get to your website or to your landing page, maybe only 10 people will watch the video and the other 90% will scroll past because they don't have the time. But those 10 people are watching are the ones that matter most. You may be able to squeeze out a couple more new patients per month, and that can really make or break profitability for your Google Ads campaign. So definitely I would consider so having social media videos on your landing page uh, as a way to help improve conversions. Yeah. Um, yeah, great tips on that. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about the, the journey when it comes to re like research, um, when it comes to pay, I know with every medical provider, it's going to be different. Maybe for, you know, Cairo, it might be faster, uh, for someone to make a decision versus someone like looking for an OBGYN. Um, so let's talk about like the process. How do people usually typically do their research? How long does it typically take? Do you have any comments on, on that? So I think that the more immediate of a need it is, the more likely they'll convert on the landing page. Like for example, if someone's in pain right now, you know, they're, they're going to just convert on the landing page and they won't do too much research amongst their, mm -hmm. amongst the local competitors. If it's something that costs a lot of money and it's a very niche problem that they have, like for example, um, let's just say neuropathy. If you don't know what neuropathy is, it's constant pain in your legs. Mm. Um, and you've had it for maybe a couple of years. You've seen a couple of doctors. No one can figure it out. So something like neuropathy, um, people may do a lot of research. And they'll go back and forth amongst various providers until they finally call you. Um, once they click on the landing page, they'll click off of it. They'll go to your Google My Business review to look you up on Yelp. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Yelp, Yelp, not Yelp. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I think healthgrade.com or something, uh, or Health Docs. I forget the site where they have a lot of doctor reviews. Zocdoc, yeah. Zocdoc, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, they'll do a lot of research. They will then... If they're really um, doing their diligence, they may then go to your social media, such as TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and try to get a, a feel for your personality. So after all of that, they may then come back to the homepage and say, you know, they'll decide to give you a call. So this may take a few days. It may take a couple of weeks, just depending on their timeline. So the point in all of this is that a lot of times people won't always convert on the landing page. They may convert the a couple of weeks down too. the road. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's hard to measure within our, our dashboard because we can't always track, uh, due to privacy laws, we can't always track what happens after the initial visit. But it's something to consider. Yeah. And then another thing too is, you know, someone might go to Google, look at your landing page, and then they might convert on Yelp, or they might convert off of your main website, um, or they might convert off of ZocDoc. Uh, but, it, you know, Google may have been part of that in terms of like an assisted conversion, um, you know, so it should get, you know, some level of credit for being able to, you know, help to drive that um, conversion in. Um, let's talk about qualification process, best practices, and so forth in terms of uh, medical practices. I know we, we already have a video about um, 
in terms of uh, qualification, in, ter- in terms of lead follow up, but maybe we can take one or two minutes to talk about the qualification process and what you typically recommend to your uh, medical practices. So if we go back to the whole insurance thing, like, do you take insurance or do you don't? I've had doctor offices where they don't take insurance, but they say, Dean, that's okay. We, d- we still want those phone calls because our front desk is really, really good at uh, <laughs> persuading them to still come I mean, in. For, I like, know where this is evaluation. going, Dean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you feel very confident in your front desk operations, that they can convert some of these, uh, I guess what some people would consider like, you know, ca- tire kickers or, you know, low ball, uh, inquiries. Um, I would say by all means do it. Um, but definitely one of the things that's out of our control as marketers is your front desk operations. Uh, if you have really bad front desk operations where maybe it's swamped or maybe they're, they're just not very charming over the phone, uh, that will affect your, your Google ads campaign. And that's something I also ask about during the initial vetting process where I always joke that as much as clients are vetting us, we as agencies should be vetting our clients as well to determine how good of a client they will be. And so one of the questions I ask is, well, what's your front desk operations like? You know, and it's a very open ended question. I just want to hear them answer it. If I can get a sense that it's a really good operation, then that's another reason why I may want to work with them. I've actually heard of some agency owners secret shopping their clients. So then they'll like pretend to be a patient looking for services and they will record, they will call their office and, and, and record that conversation and send it to the client. So the client knows how good the front desk uh, person did. So I think that's pretty eye opening. I haven't done it, but it sounds interesting. It sounds interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Was there anything else that you wanted to add to this conversation? No, I, I think that's it. Um, do you have any experience with Google ads versus like, uh, I guess lead gen services or paper lead? Um, not in the medical field, uh, yeah. more in the, like the legal, the legal field. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, I have in my notes here also local service ads. Um, I know LSAs exist for the healthcare niche. I've never really touched it myself just because the thing with LSAs is that it does generate a lot of conversions, but these are probably people who are very impatient and haven't done any research and they may be quality. Like off. Yeah. yeah. So if I, if I had to, you know, if, if a, if a doctor came to me and said, you know, Dean, should we do regular search ads or LSAs first? I would say prioritize search ads first before you consider Quality. LSAs. I would only do LSAs once you've maxed out your regular search ads and you have more money to spend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll go ahead and see you guys in the next one. All right. Thanks.